Uh, I am uh, as Pat mentioned, I'm a judge on the first court of appeals in Houston. I've been in that position for six years, and like most lawyers, I think I was aware that there was a Texas Constitution, but it wasn't something that I ever really had to deal with in, in my law practice. Um, and so when I became a judge, uh, I thought well, this is something that I need to get get myself educated about. Uh, almost every new judge is going to encounter subject matters on the bench that's not something that was in their wheelhouse of expertise before they came to the bench. Um, and so I kind of made it a uh, personal mission to get myself better educated about the Texas Constitution. And uh, it's something that I have enjoyed speaking about. I do some blogging about the Texas Constitution. And online, so like pretty much everybody in the world these days, uh, I like to go on Facebook and share things with people. Um, one of the things uh, that I do is uh, I share information about the Texas Constitution. Like I mentioned, I have a blog, uh, and I will uh, write little short articles about uh, things that uh, I'm following in, in my historical research. Sometimes I do a this day in history kind of entry, uh, and I'll follow day to day uh, the progress of one of the many constitutional conventions in the history of Texas. Um, the other thing that I enjoy posting online is uh, Lindsay and I have uh, a one-year-old puppy, and uh, we like to put pictures of, of Molly, our puppy, online. Uh, and one thing that's been slightly disheartening to me as I have explored the Texas Constitution is I've noticed that uh, when I, I put something online about the Texas Constitution, and then the next day I post a picture of Molly, Molly will get about 10 times as many likes as, uh, <laughs> as the Texas Constitution, uh, but that's okay. Um, uh, for better or worse, I, I don't have a speech about Molly. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Texas Constitution. And, uh, you know, there's been, uh, those of us who uh, share the values of the Tea Party in particular, we're, we're very attuned to the fact that for the last six years and longer, uh, there's been a very... Uh, heated national debate about the role of the federal government, how it's growing, what it costs, and as part of that there's a renewed interest in our U.S. Constitution, especially the limitations on the scope of federal government. We all know that's a big part of what sparked the Tea Party movement. The people in this room may also recall that after the Republican Party won a majority of the U.S. House of Representatives in the 2010 election, which was the big first Tea Party election year, right? And that was also my first year standing for election. Uh, the, the newly elected Republican majority of the House of Representatives made an important statement by publicly reading the entire text of the U.S. Constitution as the first order of business of the U.S. Congress. So that got me wondering, being a, an officer of state government, uh, how much do these same people, how much does this Tea Party audience and movement, how much do ordinary citizens really know about their state constitution and the role does, that it plays? I mean, and if we don't know about it, does this Texas constitution even really matter very much to our lives? So what I'm going to do in my time with you this evening is sketch out a broad outline of the Texas Constitution and introduce that to you, what's in it. Uh, <coughs> include some commentary about the role of history in our understanding of the Constitution, and also the role of the state Constitution as compared to the federal Constitution in, in the big picture of government. So first thing you need to know is that our current Constitution uh, was initially in, uh, enacted in 1876. The, the base document was adopted in 1876. So that's after Texas had become an independent nation, after Texas had been annexed as a state, and then we went through a few iterations of state constitutions during the Reconstruction era before enacting this 1876 document. Now, a lot of people ask me, why are you so cheap that you don't hand out a, a pocket, a full pocket Texas Constitution? Why do you only hand out the Bill of Rights? Well, I brought one, and if anybody wants it, you can have it. 
But if you go online to the Texas legislature's website and you pull up the Texas Constitution and you hit print, this is what it looks like. It's really long. Um, uh, and that's partially because a state constitution has a lot more work to do than the federal constitution does, and I'm going to address some of that. Uh, we also have to pay very close attention to the amendments. As we all know, the amendments to the U.S. Constitution are very important. In Texas, uh, a constitutional amendment is not as rare an event as the U.S. Constitution. We have 27 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, but since the initial adoption of the 1876 Constitution, and as updated through the 2014 election, which was uh, the last time that we as citizens got to pass on proposed amendments to the Constitution, we've seen a total of 673 amendments to the Texas Constitution that were formally proposed. Of those, 484 were approved by the voters and 179 were rejected. So we're much more actively engaged in amending our Texas Constitution than we are with the U.S. Constitution. Of course, this is a problem with the U.S. Constitution, right? That, that it's so difficult to make changes when we need them. That, uh, that the Supreme Court just takes it upon itself to make those changes for us, and, and we don't always like what they do there. Uh, so I would argue that one of the uh, beneficial things, that you, you will hear it argued from time to time that this is a bad thing, that, that the Constitution is being amended so frequently. I think entirely the opposite. I think that a Constitution, our experience with our state Constitution shows that is a healthy thing for the people to be able to have control over their constitution and make the amendments that are necessary uh, as society changes and the needs of the people change. We control that constitution. We haven't abdicated control of our state constitution to the, uh, to the Supreme Court. And if the Texas Supreme Court does something that we don't like, we have the ability, we're, we're constantly revising that state constitution, we have the ability to correct uh, a court decision that we don't agree with, um, or, or perhaps it's correct, it's correctly decided as a matter of law, but we the people want to change that law. We have the ability to do it, unlike uh, decisions coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court where unpopular decisions are made and the people uh, have a very difficult time making changes. Many of the amendments that we see to the Texas Constitution arise because the document itself has a highly restrictive nature. The Texas Constitution states that the state government only has those powers that are explicitly granted to it. There's nothing in the, in the Texas Constitution that functions as the equivalent of the necessary and proper clause of the U.S. Constitution, where it's sort of a catch-all phrase that gets used to justify all kinds of exercises of, of federal power. So the Constitution itself functions as a limiting document, uh, and it's not as long as every state's Constitution in the nation, but we're one of the longest. Um, um, and the reason why it's long is because, because all of the power that state government has to flow from that document, when we want to give agencies uh, the ability to do other things, we have to go back and grant that power ex explicitly. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why it's long, is because, you know, for more than a century, we've gone back and continually tinkered and added as necessary. Um, and I am going to, once I get through uh, outlining the current Constitution, I'm going to give you an overview of the seven proposed Texas constitutional amendments that were approved by our most recent legislati legislative session and which will be on the ballot in November 2015 for our approval because that's the way we amend the Constitution in Texas. All amendments first have to begin in the legislature uh, and then after receiving the requisite approval in the legislature, they go to the voters for approval in a referendum. Uh, we do not in Texas have uh, an uh, initiative process where, a, where the, the voters can start on their own with a petition, like in California, you occasionally hear about uh, there's constantly efforts in California the, to uh, amend their state constitution by petition, and we do not have that uh, in Texas. So let's turn to the 
the basic structure of the Texas Constitution. Now, uh, we have something that's called the Bill of Rights in the Texas Constitution, but unlike the U.S. Constitution, which has a Bill of Rights, which is the first set of amendments that were approved, we have as our Article I uh, a, a group of constitutional provisions that are labeled the Texas Bill of Rights. The original 1876 state constitution had 29 sections within the Bill of Rights. We've had nine added since then. And, and one thing that's interesting about the way we amend the state constitution is, unlike the U.S. Constitution, where uh, if you have a pocket constitution, uh, the base document is exactly like was originally enacted, and, and then the amendments appear afterwards, and, and you have to you sort of have to cross-reference to know that some of the original provisions have been nullified or, or superseded by the amendments. Uh, we approach it differently with the state constitution. We have had amendments that actually go back and delete out provisions and insert text and new sections within the text. So, so amendments, once they're adopted, get interspersed within the text. So the document that you're holding, if you have a pocket bill of rights, it has interspersed within the original 29 sections. Uh, there are sections that were given an A and a B uh, to put them in places where it seemed to make the most sense uh, in the structure of the document. Um, it's important to think about how the State Bill of Rights relates to the Federal Bill of Rights because uh, if you read uh, those provisions in the State Bill of Rights, you'll see lots of things that seem very similar to rights that are well known to you as federal constitutional rights that are in the Constitution. There are references to rights of speech and religious exercise, uh, criminal procedure rights uh, having to do with searches and seizures, um, uh, property rights, uh, when the government can take your property and, and how they go about that. Lots of parallel pr provisions, but very few of them are worded exactly the same. And so, um, sometimes it, it raises a question then of uh, what is this state constitution doing if I already have a federal constitutional right? Uh, and I'll come back to this um, towards the end if I have time, but uh, basically the key to remember about this is that the state constitution, one thing we know about the federal constitution includes the supremacy clause. We cannot in our state constitution trump anything in the federal constitution. Um, so we can't take away through the state a right that's guaranteed under the federal constitution. But we can give you a greater right. Texas can decide we want to protect religious liberty in a more strong way. We can say we want to protect uh, people's uh, criminal procedure rights in, in a stronger way. And we do in many of these cases. Uh, uh, in Texas, the, the famous Miranda warnings have to include extra warnings because we give more protection to people in their interactions with law enforcement in Texas than are guaranteed by the federal constitution. So if the state, when, when you're comparing the state and the federal bills of rights, what you're looking for is, does the state give me more protection, more freedom than is protected under the federal government? Because if it's less, it really doesn't matter. The federal protection is going to apply and give you, give you a greater right. All right, that's Article I, the Bill of Rights. Article II then gets into the powers of government. And uh, the Texas uh, structure of government, as I'm sure you're all aware, essentially mirrors the federal structure. We have three branches of government, and that's outlined in Article II. Uh, we have three distinct departments, which are the legislative, execu executive, and judicial branches. And then we do have something that is uh, implied in the structure of the federal constitution, but it's made explicit in an important way in the Texas constitution. And that is, we have an explicit separation of powers provision in Article II of the Texas constitution. So what it says is that no person or collection of persons being of one of these departments, that the, the executive, the legislative, the judicial, 
shall exercise any power properly attached to either of the others. So um, th this is something that's implied in the way the federal government is structured, and, and we all know of this concept of separation of powers. But uh, I think it's it's interesting and important that the that the Texas Supreme Court or the, the Texas Constitution makes this a command. And as applied to my role in government as a judge, I see this as a specific grounding for demanding that judges not uh, operate in a way that we call legislating from the bench, assuming the power to impose policy when they're deciding cases. Uh, our Constitution specifically demands that judges do the judge job, legislat legislators do the legislature's job, and I use it as a reminder to myself and my colleagues when we start, you know, uh, talking about things and, and one of my colleagues maybe is, is trying to, to make that law read the way they, they like it to read or they think it ought to read what they think the better rule would be. Uh, we have to remind ourselves as judges to conduct our jobs with humility and within the scope of our responsibility and apply the law that the legislature passed and if there's a problem with it, they're the ones to fix it. We apply that law the way they wrote it. Okay, the next three articles, three, four, and five, get into the details for each of those three branches of government. Uh, article three is the legislative department. Just like the federal constitution and our federal government, we have a House and a Senate. Uh, the Texas Constitution lays out all the qualifications for office, the details of the legislative process. And the thing I like to highlight about the Texas Constitution and the legislative department is we have a great constitutional limitation that is desperately needed in the federal constitution. There is an express limitation on the power to incur debt. So section 49 of article three of the Texas Constitution says, no debt shall be created by or on behalf of the state except to supply casual deficiencies of revenue not to exceed in the aggregate at any one time $200,000 or to repel invasion, suppress insurrection or defend the state in war or as otherwise authorized by this Constitution, two-thirds of each house may call for election to authorize debt for a specific purpose. So, so what we see is the, the Constitution, the state Constitution, it does have a safety valve for extreme circumstances, repelling invasion, suppressing insurrection, defending the state in war. Okay, if necessary, the legislature has the authority to incur debt. But other than that, uh, they have to leap through incredible hurdles, uh, which would probably entail them all losing their next uh, election for office. Uh, and so uh, this is a constitutional protection that ensures that we in Texas live within our means and we don't have a state government that, that simply borrows and borrows and borrows uh, to make the machinery of state government go. Article four is the executive department. Um, and it, it lays out the, the powers and the duties of our executive offices. Now, I am going to uh, tell you the six, the six offices, and my trivia question here uh, is, uh, if somebody can tell me which of these six offices is the only executive office of, this, of the Texas Constitution that is not elected, uh, you'll get a gold star. So, uh, these are the six, governor, lieutenant governor, and of course the lieutenant governor assumes the powers of the governor whenever the governor leaves the state. We have the secretary of state, the controller of public accounts, the commissioner of the general land office, and the attorney general. Secretary of state. There you go. <laughs> secretary of state. Well, good, good. And, and I would expect uh, a Tea Party audience to, to, know, uh, to know their, their elected offices, so I'm not, I'm not surprised y'all mailed that. Um, so uh, the other key thing in this, uh, in this section that I think is very important to the functioning of state government is the appointment power of the governor. And in Texas, that is uh, an incredibly uh, 
I, I think one of the greatest powers of the governor's office because if you you can subscribe to Governor Abbott's appointments office's email list and you, you'd be amazed how many appointments the governor is constantly making. It's vacancies, it's uh, judicial vacancies, uh, <coughs> boards, school, um, you know, all the university regions, all of the various uh, boards in government. Uh, it is a great power that the governor has to fill all those positions. Okay, Article 5 is the judicial department, and here's uh, one area where our Texas Constitution does uh, get a little bit novel and, and it's different from both the U.S. Uh, Constitution and most of the states in the Union in that we have two separate high courts. We have the Texas Supreme Court, which is our highest court for civil cases, and then for criminal cases we have the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. I think there's one other state in the Union, Oklahoma, that has that kind of uh, a bifurcated uh, high court system, uh, but uh, it's, it's unique and it's something that's constantly being revisited, people asking whether that's a good system and whether we should continue it. One uh, important power of the Judicial Department is that the Supreme Court has the power to issue what's called a writ of mandamus, which can compel a state government officer to perform his or her duties under the law. Uh, and that power extends to every officer of state government except one, and that's the governor. One last thing uh, th that I find interesting uh, in the Judicial Department is that under Article 5, all judges in Texas are considered to be conservators of the peace, which means they qualify as peace officers for purposes of all the state statutes that uh, that govern uh, peace officers. Uh, for example, there's a lot of uh, laws that's, that uh, go to uh, carrying a weapon and, and other special rules for peace officers. Okay, so once we've gotten through three, four, and five, we've got our basic framework for government. <coughs> and then the rest of the state constitution starts filling in details uh, that are very important for the operation of, of the government. So Article 6 is entitled Suffrage. That has to do with can you all, all read that from, from where you are? Okay. Um, so, so suffrage is, is voting, and uh, these are uh, the people in Texas who are disqualified from voting under the Constitution. If you're under 18 years old, if you've been determined mentally incompetent by a court, if you've been convicted of, of a felony, um, and then uh, the legislature is also responsible for enacting laws to exclude from the right of suffrage people who have been convicted of bribery, perjury, forgery, or other high crimes. Uh, and then, of course, uh, very important, and it's amazing to me that there are parts of the country that, that want to do away with this kind of a requirement, but Section 2A of Article 6 of the Texas Constitution says that qualified voters include every person subject to none of the disqualifications I just read, who is a citizen of the United States and who is a resident of the state. So um, we have the very commonsensical rule that to vote in Texas, you have to be an American citizen and you have to be a resident of Texas. Uh, and that is enshrined in our Constitution. Um, as, as we read in the paper, I mean, people in California and other parts of the country think that you shouldn't even have to be a citizen to, be, to have the right to vote. and that. That issue has been resolved in our state constitution. Article 7 has to do with education. Now, now we're getting into something that there's not a word in the federal constitution about education. Uh, education is one of the most important functions, some would say absolutely the most important function, of state government. Uh, it, is, it is one of the two largest budget items for the state. And education, uh, as Terry knows, uh, there's, there's a lot going on with uh, the regulation of, of the state education system. So uh, we, have, we have, first of all, uh, an extensive set of constitutional rules that, uh, that govern state education and then also a lot of statutes as well. So reflecting the importance of, of this area for state government, Section 1 says, a general diffusion of knowledge being essential to the preservation of the liberties and rights of the people, 
It shall be the duty of the legislature of the state to make, I'm sorry, to establish and make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of an efficient system of public free schools. And that's, uh, that's one of the core uh, responsibilities of government. Now, when I was in law school, somebody brought to my attention, this is one of these UT versus Aggie things that, uh, that people like to point out. Um, so don't anybody be offended. Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just pointing out what's in the Constitution. Uh, section, ten, section 10 calls for the establishment of a university of the first class to be located by a vote of the people of this state and styled the University of Texas for the promotion of literature and the arts and sciences. And then section 13 calls for the creation of an agricultural and mechanical college. Uh, and you'd be interested to know that th this is obviously the, uh, the historical basis for Texas A&M. Uh, in the Constitution, the, the historical origins of Texas A&M call that it be made and constituted a branch of the University of Texas for instruction in agriculture, the mechanic arts, and the natural sciences connected therewith. So there, there's another little piece of trivia for you. We, we all came from the same, we're, we're all branches of the same tree. All right, next in the last, oh, I got two more on here. Okay, um, Article 8 uh, is taxation and revenue. And um, this is very important because uh, it, it called, it, has to do with how we fund the state government. And, and what this part of the state constitution consists of is primarily restrictions on the collection of local taxes. There are a lot of, of rules that say that your, your local government you know, can only do certain things to raise revenue to, to pay for local government. And I think probably every Texan's favorite part of Article 8, I think they all know this exists, but they don't know that it's in Article 8 of the Texas Constitution. Uh, Section 24A is the part that provides there shall be no personal income tax in Texas unless approved by a majority in a statewide referendum. Now, what's the likelihood of that happening, right? <laughs> so, uh, so the legislature can't impose a personal income tax on us unless we uh, approve it. And uh, fortunately, uh, that's one of the great things about living in Texas is we've, uh, we've been able to fund our government without that. Okay, I am not going to go through all of the rest of the articles the way I've gone through the ones I've just gone through, but I am going to uh, touch on the rest of them. Oh, I, I skipped nine. So nine is all about counties, and county government is, is an important uh, function of, of our local government as well. And then th there are all these areas, some of which have become less important over time, but when the Constitution was initially act enacted uh, in 1876, railroads was a very important, uh, 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 very important to the economy of the state, the growth of the state, and, and so we have railroads and then Authorization for municipal corporations and private corporations. Article 13, yeah, uh, have it on there, uh, has been entirely repealed. That had to do with the status of Spanish and Mexican land titles. So when Texas became an independent nation and then uh, a state of the United States, there were lots of property disputes that had that sort of centered on okay, who controls this property based on all the different authorities that had governed Texas in, in recent history. Article 14 uh, is, uh, is the one that governs uh, George P. Bush. This is uh, the Public Lands and Land Office article, and it establishes the General Land Office. Article 15 is about impeachment. The power to impeach in Texas belongs to uh, the House of Representatives. Um, and uh, a governor may appoint a provisional appointee until a decision on impeachment. The trial of an impeachment, like in the U.S. Constitution, happens in the Senate, requires two-thirds two vote to uh, remove uh, somebody who's been impeached. And then appellate judges, like me, can be removed on two-thirds vote of each house. Uh, Article 16 is titled General Provisions, and that tells you absolutely nothing. Uh, but uh, that is important to us in Texas because that's where the rules establishing community property 
uh, are found. And when Texas became a state, that was fairly different than much of the rest of the nation at the time. Uh, since the time that Texas became a state, many of the western states do have community property like us in Texas, but, but this was something that was a bit novel when Texas, uh, Texas came into the Union. Then finally, Article 17 is the mode of amending the Constitution, and like I already told you, it has to originate in the legislature, then be approved by the voters.